Several weeks ago, we had a young family that visited our Lord's Day morning worship services. He was a man and his wife. I believe they had three children. I believe it was a young family of five, but they never visited with us before. And uh, I was proud of how everybody welcomed them, made them feel at home. And, uh, one of the, uh, the, the uh, one of them, the father or the mother, uh, asked where the classrooms were because they wanted, you know, their kids to be put in classes. And one of the brethren explained to them that we would not, you know, divide the body up into classes, but we sure hoped that they would enjoy and benefit from our worship services. Well, we went ahead and we began services. By the time the singing was over, they had gathered up their belongings and they left the building. Obviously, they were not interested in what we had to offer. Well, uh, a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, there was a woman probably in her, well, she was uh, probably in her 40s. I don't know if that's risky. You know, you start guessing the women's age. But anyhow, she uh, <clears throat> Ada, she located near our church building and uh, she attended worship Lord's Day morning. She indicated she was a member of the church and that she'd be worshiping with us on a regular basis and said she had a, a, an adult son who lived in the area who had a family, but they never attended with her. But she was there regularly. She was a flight attendant and was gone on occasion. But, uh, you know, after a couple of years, one, we began to notice that she was missing for about three Lord's Days in a row. We became concerned about her a little bit. One of the sisters ran into her downtown one day, and she said, Sonny, we've been missing you. And she kind of got a sheepish look on her face, and she said, well, they, and we just assumed she was talking about her family, they wanted me to go to a larger church that has more to offer. And she said, you know, I, I feel bad about it, Y'all have been so nice to me. We haven't seen her since. Well, I could recount dozens of stories just like those two people who have come through our doors and have left us because they found churches down the road that have more to offer. This dilemma, however, is not ours alone. I was reading uh, the Christian Chronicle, which is a newspaper affiliated with Oklahoma Christian University. It's a newspaper a circulation news about churches of Christ. And I ran across an article in there by a fellow by the name of David Tant. And it was under the heading of, Are You a Full Service Church? And he said, The religious world is one of fierce competition, just like the world of car sales. Dealerships compete by offering friendly salespeople an up to date service center, free loaners, and comfortable waiting rooms. And sometimes we treat churches the same way. I get calls asking, what does your congregation have to offer? Do you have a sports program, a youth minister, daycare, a mother's morning out program, divorce recovery, praise bands? Are you a full service church? Well, you know, that resonated with me immediately because I've been asked those very same questions from time to time in my experience. You know, the one question I have not been asked that I'm waiting to be asked is, how many people will your building comfortably sleep? Well, that's usually what you ask when you're uh, shopping maybe for a new yacht or a new boat. How many will it comfortably sleep? Now, I've not heard that one yet. But again, it's not this uh, dilemma, this situation is certainly not unique to us. I read a web page on the internet just, uh, I think it was a week before last, and it was by a denominational preacher. He was affiliated with uh, what they call the charismatic group. Not the charismatic, they call themselves the evangelical group. There are several denominations affiliated with it, but he was from one that is charismatic, kind of in, in flavor. But anyhow, he uh, was uh, writing about this very same situation, and he said that his brotherhood, talking about his own brotherhood, he said, we have created the low-impact, high-maintenance believer. And then he gave the initials as a de designation, the L-I-H-M-B, the low-impact, high-maintenance believer. He said, this is a monstrosity of the church growth movement. 
And the church, so-called church growth movement, began about 25 or 30 years ago that resulted in mega churches. And the idea is that the only criterion for determining success are attendance figures. And so it's growth by any means. He said, we have created a monstrosity as a result of the church growth movement. And he said, how do I explain it? He said, think of the intensive care unit. There's a tube up the nose and an IV in the arm pumping fluid or painkillers. There's a heart monitor and a breathing machine. They all serve the same purpose. They keep the patient alive artificially. He said, many church programs uh, of ours do that today. He said, the difference between hospital and church care is the machines in the hospital are for those who can't do for themselves. In the church, is for those who won't do for themselves because they are fickle. They have started a price war between churches uh, offering discounted discipleship. Preachers compete to have the shortest service, the most convenient parking, best coffee, and the least offensive sermon. Suddenly, our services have become like speed dating. Uh, we now have the odd irony. Church used to be about getting people to God. Now it seems to be about protecting people from God. I thought that's pretty good. And it's uh, similar to what John MacArthur, the denominational preacher and author, wrote uh, about 25 years ago in a book called Ashamed of the Gospel. We know Paul warned us that this would take place in 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. He said, in the last days, he said, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own thoughts, they shall keep to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Still, we are forced, I think, to take a hard look at ourselves when we see other churches using gimmicks to entice big crowds and people leaving our ranks because we just do not have enough to offer. What do we have to offer? And that's what I want to take a look at for the remainder of our study this morning. What do we have to offer? Well, first of all, the church offers the church itself. And that may sound redundant to you. You know, during the Reformation, the American Reformation movement, there were preachers like uh, Alexander and Thomas Campbell, uh, Martin W. Stone, and uh, Raccoon John Smith and others that never got tired of saying that they didn't want to introduce anything new into the Lord's church. They were uh, against innovations that uh, were not authorized in the Word of God. Their sole interest was in restoring New Testament Christianity according to the divine pattern in God's Word. By contrast, churches today keep trying to introduce something new into the church each generation to make it more appealing, uh, to make adjustments to reach each generation. But you know, the sad truth is that in the conclusion, they're disappointed because each generation is hungry for spiritual fulfillment that's not found in entertainment or a gimmick or in the latest techno trend. They are desperately longing for something completely unique Something that only the church can truly offer. As one author says, the world desperately needs, not for the church to do the church differently, but rather for the church to be the church. And so, that's what we offer initially. We offer the church being the church. Now, in addition to that, the church offers the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it and it alone has power and life. In Romans 1 verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In Revelation, the first chapter, the church is referred to as a golden candlestick. And uh, some translations say a golden lampstand. It's called golden as an indication of what it's worth, of its value. And it is a, a candlestick. Now, you know, a candle today can be used as a, an ornament of beauty, as a decoration. But in the first century, the purpose of a candle was to hold up light 
to help people to see. And that analogy is what the Lord has in mind when He declares that the church is a golden candlestick for the purpose of bringing light into a world so that they might see God. They might see their lost condition. They might see the way to salvation. There was a man by the name of Ernie Pyle. Ernie Pyle was a famous war correspondent back during World War II. He was a gifted writer. And he thrilled America with his eyewitness accounts of uh, the bloody events of that war. Pyle himself was killed by Japanese ma a machine gun fire in Okinawa in 1945. One day, though, he was uh, walking along the beach on a South Pacific island following an invasion of the United States forces. And I mean, there was havoc, there was mayhem, there was carnage everywhere he looked. Uh, so many of these young men that lost their lives when they hit the beach. And uh, during the lull of the battle, Powell was walking on the beach and he was just looking at the bodies of these dead American soldiers. And he noticed that one of the young men's body was turned in just such a way that he could see a little bit of testament sticking to that boy's shirt pocket. And he reached down and he pulled it out of his shirt pocket and he began to come through it as he walked on down the beach. And after a while, he went back and he stuck that little New Testament back in his pocket and he was trying to, you know, just trying to resolve in his own mind what this is all about, all this carnage around him and finding the words of life in that Lord's pocket. He knew a preacher who lived back here on the mainland and he wrote him a letter and he said, if you have any light, please, Shine it my way. Well, you know, that's what we do as the church. We live in a dark world, darkened by sin, suffering, and sorrow. It's darkened by death, disease, and disaster. It's darkened by poverty and perversion. It's darkened by anger, abuse, and anxiety. And I'll tell you, along with Ernie Powell, the whole world is saying, if you've got some light, Shine it my way. And of course, that's what the church is here to do. It's here to shine God's light into this world of sin and darkness. To hold up the light of hope. To hold up the light of forgiveness and love and eternal life. To point people to Jesus Christ, the light of the world. John 8 and verse 20. Our mission is summed up so well by Charles Gabriel's old hymn, Sing the Light. There's a call comes ringing for the restless way. Send the light. Send the light. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. Send the light. Send the light. Send the light. The blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light. The blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. I've been in Carlsbad Cavalry twice. That's my recollection. Early in 1970, I was conducting a meeting in Midland, Texas, and a group of us went over to Carlsbad one day. And then later, I think about 1990, you don't remember for sure, I'd have to look it up. I was conducting a meeting in Andrews, Texas, and my younger son, David, David was probably maybe 10 years old at that time. I took David over to Carlsbad. You know, both times we, we, uh, when we got down with the group, way down into the depths of the caverns, the uh, guide told everybody to make sure, you know, be steady, you know, be sure your footing is good and so on, and then turn the lights out. And I think he did that to dramatize how really dark it is and how quiet it is that far beneath the surface of the earth. There was one occasion, though, that when they cut the lights off, there was a little girl that shrieked. And then she burst into tears. Of course, everybody could hear it so quiet. But then everybody heard her older brother speak up when he said, Don't cry. There's somebody here who knows how to turn on the lights. Well, so it is today with the world. I mean, we're living in a world of darkness and sin. But we say to those who are crying out, about that. Don't worry. There's somebody who's been here who knows how to turn on the lights. Well, we need the sense of urgency today, of immediacy. 
and uh, of identification with souls that are lost in darkness and in sin. What we need is the church to be the church, a golden candlestick holding out light to this world of sin and darkness. Furthermore, the church offers doctrinal soundness. In Acts 2 and verse 42, we're told that the first century Christians, after having obeyed the gospel, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. Now, the faithfulness to the doctrinal content of the gospel is the greatest challenge of the church in every generation and in every location in the world. There are a lot of social and civic groups that practice a lot of the same things the church practices. I mean, there are a lot of civic groups that practice uh, high moral living. There's a lot of civic groups that will practice self-discipline, and they will discipline their own members if the members violate the rules. There's a lot of social and civic groups that practice uh, outreach, to those on the outside, you know, especially those who are in need or uh, in, in, uh, of assistance and so on. Well, why are they not called the church? The reason is because they don't have the doctrine. We are the church because of what we believe and based upon what we, and, and what we do, based upon the authority of the Word of God. For example, we believe in the infinite personal God of heaven and earth. That he revealed himself through his prophets and his apostles who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. We believe that he uniquely showed himself uh, to us in the person of his son Jesus of Nazareth. There's a certain doctrine concerning Jesus Christ. That he was born of a virgin. That he died on the cross to provide atonement for our sins. He was raised bodily from the tomb. He rules over His people from heaven until the time that He will return and judge the world. There's an excellent summary of these doctrines of Christ in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. We have a doctrine concerning our responsibility in salvation. We're to believe in Jesus as the Son of God, John 8, and verse 24. We're to believe that He died, was buried, and rose again the third day, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. We are to repent of our sins, Acts 17, verse 30, Acts 2, and verse 38. To confess His name before others, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33, and then we are to be baptized in water for the remission of sins, Acts 2, and verse 38, Mark 16, and 16. Friends, we can't teach anything other than that and be true to the doctrinal content of the gospel. There's a doctrine for the pattern and the organization of the church. 1 Peter 5 and verse 2, where qualified men are found, elders should be ordained. Uh, in Acts 6 and verses 1 through 3, deacons should be appointed to assist. And in Hebrews 13 and verse 17, every member respects and submits to the scriptural leadership of the church. So, in terms of worship, work projects, or any other activities of the church, the primary question must be, is it doctrinally correct? Is it doctrinally sound? I was reading a journal, a religious journal called Christianity Today, just last week. And uh, it's not affiliated with Churches of Christ, but it's a denominational journal. But I've taken it for years just to see, you know, what, uh, what's going on in the world. And, um, of course, you know, in January, that's when everybody begins to want to, prop, you know, kind of, uh, you know, we'll take a look at what might happen down the rest of the year. And I ran across an article titled, Ten Steps Every Church Must Take This Year or Be Dead in a Decade. If that got my attention. <laughs> Ten Steps Every Church Must Take This Year or Be Dead in a Decade. Uh, this author says, I believe the next decade will be critical for churches in the Western Hemisphere. He said, the culture around us is experiencing a once in a millennium shift right now. That's once in a 1,000 years. I believe he's probably right. Our culture is experiencing a shift 
right now, the kind of which probably only occurs about once every 1,000 years. He said uh, there is a recalibration of the way we think about everything. Morality, sexuality, identity, and theology. He said, in view of that, what's the church to do? You know what he said the number one thing is that the church must do if it's going to survive for another decade? He said, number one, they need to stand strong on the unchanging fundamental principles of God's Word. And then incredibly, he quotes from the Washington Post. The Washington Post did a study of churches in America and uh, try to find out, you know, what's the major reason that some churches are dying and or dead or the churches that are surviving and some even thriving. And the main, main difference between those that are surviving and some even thriving and those that are dying and are dead is that the ones that are surviving are the ones who stand firm <laughs> on the Bible essentials or fundamentals from God's Word. Well, that's interesting to me. I didn't need a newspaper to tell you that. As this fellow went on to say, the fellow writing the article, in Christianity Today, he said, you know, that shows that any church that abandons basic biblical principles will not only fail to survive, he said, they don't deserve to survive. But I believe that's right too. Well, we are God's faithful people only so long as we abide in the truth. In 2 John in verse 9, John says, Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the teaching hath not God. He that abideth in the teaching, the same hath both the Father and the Son. And then in addition to that, the church offers worship in spirit and in truth. In John 4 and verse 24, Jesus said that God desires and He deserves worship in spirit and in truth. We are the, the special group of redeemed people authorized to offer up worship to God. And we see ourselves in, uh, in, in probably not in the true perspective when we began to neglect the worship of our Creator and Sustainer. I want you to notice how each aspect of worship is designed in such a way that while we engage in it, not only are we praising and exalting God, but we're also looking to some need on our own spiritual part. Teaching, for example. Not only do we praise and make known God, but we also nurture our own faith. Romans 10 verse 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Singing. When we sing, not only are we praising the God whom we adore, but we're also exhorting ourselves to spiritual living. Colossians 3 and 16, Ephesians 5 and 19. The giving of our money to finance the work of the church. It makes us partners in the work of God and it keeps us from selfishness. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7. And our united prayers give us power with God in the certain knowledge that He hears and He will answer our request. James 5 and verse 16. The Lord's Supper. It is uh, the spiritual, it's, it's the central episode in the whole scheme of redemption, it takes our minds back to the central episode in the whole scheme of redemption. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 and 17. And it is precisely because worship meets such a, an urgent spiritual need that Christians are taught never forsake the assembling of yourselves together for worship. Hebrews 10 and verse 25. Well, Acts 2 and verse 42 tells us that the apostles' doctrine fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers were observed and steadfastly observed. And those things are just as effective for our worship today as they were in the first century. One other thing that the church offers, and that is a brotherhood of loving fellowship. The church is intended to be a center for fellowship and mutual encouragement among believers. On the, old, the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, we're told, it written about 400 years before Christ, we're told about uh, when God was trying to prepare a slothful and a spiritually 
lazy people for the coming of the Messiah into the world. And in Malachi 3 and verse 16, the Bible says, Then they that feared the Lord spake one with another, and Jehovah hearkened, and heard, and a book of remembrance was writ written before him for them that feared Jehovah and that thought upon his name. I want you to notice now the three acts of turning in these people as they began to fear the Lord. They began to shake off their indifference by being together, speaking one with another about God, and thinking on His purposes for their lives. Being together, speaking one with another about God, and thinking upon God's purposes for their lives. And friends, the, the people in every generation need the spiritual stimulation that comes from the above. We have certain social needs for friendship and community. And the fellowship of the church helps to meet and satisfy them. In Romans 12 and verse 15, we share joys and sorrows. Hebrews 10 and verse 24, we encourage one another in things that are good. In Galatians 6 and verse 1, we pick up the brother or the sister who stumbles. Uh, we rejoice in our mutual hope in Christ. I'm not so naive as to believe or have you believe that once you become a Christian and God adds you to the family, the spiritual family, that you're going to enter into a perfect society, a utopia, and that you're not ever going to have another problem, another care, another disagreement. It helps to remember that the church is a family. And it's made up of all, of, of all ages and stages of development. And just as a family may have parents who are adult, teachers who are in their adolescent years and little children, so the church has people at many stages of development. And we don't expect babies to act like teenagers. We don't expect teenagers to act like adults. And neither should we expect every member of the church to act like a mature Christian. There's a small town out between Big Spring and Midland, Texas, called Stanton. And you know, for years, they had a sign out at their city limits that said, Welcome to Stanton, home of 3,000 friendly folks and a few old sore heads. <laughs> I love that sign. I think you probably could sign up like that the uh, city limits of every town, every city, uh, every congregation, every family, because that's just the way it is. And that's because you're dealing with people. But you know what? We're commanded to love our brethren, our brothers and sisters of Christ. And so don't take offense uh, and assume the worst uh, about every statement or action of a brother or a sister. Don't run your tongue to say unkind things about them. Don't create friction by allowing some unresolved grievance to just go on and on and on. Paul says in Galatians 5 and verse 15, But if you bind and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Then we're told to be alert to the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Philippians 2 and verse 14, Paul says, Look not every man upon his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Love for one another. That's supposed to be a special characteristic of disciples of Christ. Jesus said in John 13, verses 34 and 35, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. What does the church have to offer today? First of all, it has, it, it, it offers you the church. Just being the church. It offers the gospel light that can bring light to this world of sin and darkness. It offers the doctrine of soundness that is imperative. If we expect to survive in this once in a thousand years cultural shift, it offers worship in spirit and truth. And it offers a loving fellowship within the family of God. Paul says in 
In spite of that, however, in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5, that there shall come in the last days those that have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Paul uses that term godliness in the pastoral epistles, and that's 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. He uses that word repeatedly to refer to true religion. True religion. Paul says there is a life-changing, soul-saving power inherent in godliness or true religion. He says, but if pretenders deny that power in exchange for <coughs> gimmicks, the latest techno trend, entertainment, whatever, Paul says, turn away from them. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5. In other words, don't run after them and, and beg them and plead with them to come back and we'll promise them the moon if they'll just do that. No. He said, turn away from them. He says, uh, uh, drain the swamp. But on the other hand, if you will find an honest hearted seeker, and they can understand that we're offering godliness or true religion, they'll see that's an offer they simply cannot refuse. And I'm wondering this morning if they're here, you're here today, and you. You understand that offer, but yet you've not responded to it. Why don't you seize the opportunity now? Surely you believe in God, believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess His name before this audience, and we stand ready and willing to assist you in baptism into the Lord's church. If you are a Christian, you are a member of the family of God, but you turned your back upon Him, you've walked in open rebellion, why not return back to Him this morning, repent of your sins, confess them, and uh, receive the prayers of the faithful that you might be forgiven. While we stand and sing, won't you come? <laughs>